<laughs> Next, um, we'll hear from Eric Borwinkle on development and application of polygenic risk scores. Good morning, and um, am, I, am I leaned in enough now? Just barely, really? It's for short people here. <laughs> All right, yeah. Hi, good morning. Um, I, of course, want to thank um, the organizers for the opportunity to speak, and uh, hopefully this lecture is designed to be a, a informative and, and hopefully a little bit of fun um, as we go through. Uh, first, you know, it's always good to start with well, why do we do what we do? Um, you know, and stand back a little bit. Well, you know, why do we do human genetics? <clears throat> first, it, it teaches us a little bit about who we are and, and where we came from. That's sort of the National Geographic, the kind of human nature. I mean, and it hopefully inspired you all when you were kids, and hopefully it inspires you today. And the, the second is it, it teaches us a little bit about the, the biology of disease, and, and at least some of that has led to new therapeutic approaches for disease. And the third is prediction. Um, genetics has historically always been strong in prediction. My guess is in the breakfast you had out there today is the result of genetic manipulation of food products that, that gave us really the nutritional information that we have today. And it was really driven by prediction. Um, you know, net, net selection in the field. If you can't read this at the bottom, it's, I don't really know if Niels Bohr actually said this, but it says it's difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. And, and I do think it's, it's good to also make the point that risk is, is a comment about predicting the future, not so much about counting um, frequencies of, of events today. Often we, we get the data by counting of events today, and, and we use that, th that information to make predictions about the future. Th throughout the, this talk, there's going to be a series of these slides. I believe there's three. <clears throat> Some editorial comments about genetic risk scores or polygenic risk scores. And the first one is they're not new. Um, I think that's important to realize. It's not like they, you know, they came out in 2015. Um, you know, the, the first example that I could find was around 2002. There are quite a few in, during the 2000s. 2002, um, the paper that used basically several hundred loci um, to make information about prediction. The first one that uses the word genetic risk scores that I could find is in 2005, and, and then some of my own work was in 2007. So, so I think it is important to realize there's, there's, a, there's a strong history here of, of using information about multiple loci to make predictions about disease. As was commented, it, most of it has been in the cardiovascular or cardiometabolic um, arena, but, but not all of it. So I'll go through a little bit um, some of that early, whoops, or whoop, maybe I won't. Here we go. So first of all, how do you make a risk score? It, it's, it's really, it's not rocket science at the superficial level. Uh, first of all, you have to select some variants or SNPs that go into it. Um, and typically, this has been done from large GWAS studies. Um, the easiest way is people have gone in and grabbed the Sentinel SNP from, from large GWAS studies y y using some p-value threshold, either a p-value of genome-wide significance or often people have made a case for, since we're generating a risk score, dipping below that, that threshold that we know and love of like 5 times 10 to the minus 8th. Then the second, once you have a set of SNPs and hopefully relatively independent variants, you, you just simply can add them up, you, you know, and, and you can either add them up in, in a weighted way, and, and, and Adrian g gave us some examples where the beta coefficient from some regression was used, or you can just do them unweighted. Um, you could score, you know, big A, big A is minus one, big A, little a is zero, little a, little a is plus one, for example, and, and both have been done. If you look in the literature, both weighted and unweighted have been done. I put parameter estimation estimation in red because if you look at the statistics literature in this field today, an inordinate amount of work is how you get better estimates of those betas, particularly for rare variants. Um, and I'll, I'll talk just a little bit about it, in, I think, in the next slide. 
Then the, the third thing is to, to, a little bit tricky, is you all are used to looking at relative risks. You have to transmit those relative risks into absolute risks. So the risk score itself deals with absolute risks. Uh, Adrian hinted at this, but there's, there's really, we're not, we didn't, we chose not to make these statistical talks. They get a little dry and a tad boring, even at whatever it is, uh, 920. Um, but, but beware, there's a, there's a, be aware, not, you also should probably be beware and be aware. <laughs> there, there's a strong methodologic underpinning to this. Um, the, this is not just, you know, sort of making it up as you go. Um, one is parameter estimation, uh, particularly as, as the field transitions into more rare variants or low frequency variants. It turns out those beta estimates are really tough to get. And so there's a lot of Bayesian estimation and, and the, the field is known as shrinkage, shrinkage estimators. The other is getting relative, you know, moving from relative risk to, to absolute risks. <clears throat> Again, it's not so straightforward how you do that and how you express that absolute risk. I, I think it was probably Framingham who gave us the tradition of, of expressing absolute risks, you know, per, per 10 years, you know, the, the, the rate per 10 years. And then finally, the, the evaluation. You know, some, the, the graph on the left is some function of sensitivity and specificity and looking at those area under the ROC curves. And the other is just sort of using the equation and putting people into buckets and seeing if you do better putting people into the right bucket when you use genetic information rather relative not using genetic information. So let's just walk through an example of some of this real quickly. Um, number one is, you know, there, there have been now a, a number of genome-wide associations for coronary heart disease, some of it is shown here. So you can go in and you can pick, you can pick the loci um, based on the, these results. And, and here's an example where on the left are, are relative risks for, for a, a locus I know and love, a variant at 9P21. It's interesting because it doesn't influence disease through traditional risk factors. And then the others then transmit that information from relative risk on the left to absolute risk on the left, which here is expressed as percent per, per, for 10 years, okay? And then finally, you could take that, that was one locus. You can, you can basically um, take that kind of scenario and put it across many loci. And this happens to be a risk score that's not weighted. And so if any of you ever doubted the central limit theorem, the central limit theorem indeed is, is definitely true. Um, when, you, when you take a bunch of things and you sum them up, it's an almost perfect normal distribution. Um, if you look at the weighted risk scores, they tend not to be so normal. Um, and for example, then you can compare people in the upper tail, in the upper tail to the lower tail. In this particular case, this is Eric, and, and the relative risk now is about twofold um, risk of disease of here compared to here. And then finally, you can do things, um, again, asking whether the genetic risk score predicts um, above and beyond the traditional risk score. And here's just an example where a genetic risk score that was developed in whites was tested in African Americans. And one can see um, there's the area under the ROC curve at the top, it's point, or 0.7588, and it goes from 7588 to 7719, and that's, quote, statistically significant by just adding the genetic risk score. And then, but for most people, me included, those numbers mean nothing. It's just sort of gobbledygook. And so what one did is I took hypertension in and out and took LDL cholesterol in and out. So you can see the relative impact of these traditional risk factors relative to the genetic risk score. Not surprising given that this is a sample of African Americans. Um, hypertension has a much larger impact. Um, LDL cholesterol, um, much less so. So the second editorial comment is, why are we so gaga about them today? I think really there's two reasons. One is, for the first time in the era, era of sort of complex disease genomics, we have genes, or we have loci at least, you know, for, for many of these conditions. We have lots of I have loci. You know, it's, it's almost a spectator sport to badmouth GWAS. 
But nonetheless, GWAS has given us a lot of loci for a lot of common chronic diseases. And the other is we're fundamentally asking the question the field is, um, and we're representing the field, now what are we going to do? You know, we have, we have the lo these loci, so now what are we going to do? Um, and this being America and capitalism being what it is, some people think, well, we can probably make money um, given these genetic risk scores. And so there's a lot of money now in diagnostic testing. Um, common diseases are common. We should probably think a little bit about that. So if you're going to apply genomics in healthcare, we should, we're challenged, the field is challenging itself to make an impact in, in common disease. And the other I think we should take advantage of or not forget is, you know, Gina um, helped us. And then also that genes themselves are not sort of patented. And I, and I, th I think the Supreme Court in some ways has laid a strong foundation to allow us to get to this point of asking how we can apply um, this information in, in a clinical context. I like this paper a lot. It's a review in Nature Genetics by Chatterjee. Um, and it just simply lays out um, in a, in a it's, it's a paper you can read at like three different levels. Just sort of read it and enjoy it or, or buried into the details. And it lays out really um, in, in very logical terms on the bottom in a green box, and I, I realize you can't read that. It's just how would you construct a genetic risk score for breast cancer? So you have, um, quote, major genes such as BRCA1 and BRCA2. You have the results of GWAS, and you have family history, and you have the ability to put all those together. And then finally, in the middle, you can create people low risk, medium risk, and high risk. Again, this is a weighted risk score now. And he, he defines then those that are high risk, and then asking in the clinic, what are you going to do about the people that are high risk? And we know up there, you can see, um, you could probably guess what's in there, um, basically more aggressive. Um, monitoring, um, imaging, prophylactic either drugs or surgery. So, so it, it's a nice paper in terms of taking you through the steps of applying a genetic risk score. Here's a couple of the next slides have a few more examples of how you can be, how you could apply them. This happens to be my favorite. Um, it's a female age 57, looks a lot like Madonna. Actually, I read yesterday she has a new album. So. Um, she's taking um, hypertension medications. <laughs> she has an LDL cholesterol of 150, and her 10-year CHD risk is 15%. Um, if most physicians, if you ever wonder what the physician's doing in the corner of the office, he's not sort of texting his, his kids, They're, you know, putting all this information in, and there's, there's, there's professional guidelines about when you should have an LDL lowering therapy and what the target should be when you should have antihypertension therapy and what the target should be. So Madonna is basically in this intermediate high category, and, and there, there are guidelines around that. We now genotype her. Uh, we could genotype her for a risk score. This happens to be one locus, just to make it simple, for 9P21. She's a homozygote for the high-risk uh, genotype. She goes from 15% to 21%, and therefore, according to the guidelines, when you would treat her and what the target therapy would be different, would be modified. And I would predict this is probably how risk scores are going to be most commonly used. Because to actually change professional guidelines is really, really, really tough. But you don't really need to change professional guidelines here. You're just adding a new risk factor into existing guidelines. And so what I've done here um, is taken the um, Eric study, the atherosclerosis risk and community study, and applied the same thing that was done with one person now to a sample size of around 10,000. And you could see here that there are about 2,000 people that are like Madonna, and 1,701 of them, when you apply the genetic information, they don't change their risk. But about 131 of them, or 6.5%, go up. But as was commented earlier, some people go down. Some people are genetically protected. And, and how medicine deals with the higher risk people probably is a little more straightforward. And how we deal with the low risk people, I think, is going to be a little um, more complicated. 
Uh, the last example I, I, is kind of a cute story. Most of these chronic conditions are not purely genetic. Everybody, you know, we're professionals in this room, we all know that. There's a strong genetic and environmental, and importantly, the interaction um, between the two. This is a fun slide uh, that was put together many years ago uh, with Charlie Singh looking at basically genotype and risk factors and how that influence really the trajectory across age, how one um, basically moves across the risk um, surface. But along with St. Catharacin, we again in the Eric study, it's interesting. Um, this is the, the years of follow-up and disease right here, looking at a genetic risk score here, and also an environmental risk score, smoking, BMI, exercise, and diet. Probably isn't fair to call BMI um, an environmental risk score, but it, you get the point. And notice, first of all, notice the uncanny similarity between these two curves. One's purely genetic, one's purely quote unquote environmental. But the important part of this paper isn't these, these graphs, the important part is if indeed you're high risk, so these people, whoops, sorry, these people in red, are you quote doomed to have heart disease? Or if you modify your environment, can you lower your risk? And indeed, you can. So let's just look at the three bar graphs to the right, if you don't mind. Um, these are all the people that are genetically at high risk. And now we've put further partitioned them into environmentally low risk, medium risk, and high risk. And notice the important part is if you're genetically at high risk, but yet you don't smoke, you maintain ideal body weight, you, et cetera, you can indeed lower your risk on par with those that are medium risk. Indeed, if you're genetically at high risk and you have a poor lifestyle, you have a very high risk of disease overall. My last example, I believe it was, is with Alzheimer's disease. So what's shown here, again, this is age, this is risk, um, making it simple, this red or maroon, I guess, dotted line are people that have an E4 allele. This really is a, a polygenic risk score for Alzheimer's disease, um, including APOE, by the way. So notice that those people are at very high risk. This is the mean of the population here, and there are people that are protected. So again, what goes up must come down. So there's people that are protected from disease and high risk. And if you follow, particularly as we get older, if you follow the literature for clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease, the results are depressing. Um, they're very depressing. Um, there is a tremendous amount of work across pharma, less and less because some are getting out. Um, the drugs haven't worked. But now what would be interesting is it's not really repurposing, but re-examine those same drugs. But now instead of treating disease, what can be done to prevent disease in people who are not symptomatic? And I don't have results to show you, but just let you know that some of those trials are now ongoing. So one, what we can do again with risk scores is begin to partition the population into buckets and start to do clinical trials in a more sophisticated way in, in those buckets. And for example, um, th this top one here is people with a presenilin mutation. This basically is a, more of a risk score, and this was a phenotypic um, trial. But the, the point is the same for all three, is instead of just doing a trial of disease or doing a trial randomly of prevention, do, do a trial of prevention at those who are not symptomatic but, but should be at high risk based on the risk score or other information. The other um, cautionary note, whoops, I lost my title. Is, um, what happens when you take risk scores in one population and read here ethnic group or ancestry group and apply it to another. We're going to actually talk more during the next day and a half about it, but I'll just touch on it a little bit. Remember the steps, and I believe it was my second or third slide, is, you know, whoops, sorry about that. Both the pointer and the laser, by the way, are green up here, so, all right. Um, so remember step one is to select SNPs. Um, it's very possible that among ancestry groups, you may have, if, if indeed you just limited yourself to publications within that ancestry group, you may, you may select different SNPs. 
I did make a point about you know, building calculating the, the genetic risk score, polygenic risk score, and those beta estimates. That's where it really gets tricky among, among ethnic groups, is how you, you, you estimate the, the, the betas that are applicable um, to different ethnic groups. And then finally, as you transition from relative risk to absolute risk, that calculation is very different among ethnic groups because of, of different baselines and of different inputs that go into that calculation. And so this was a very nice work that came out of the Broad. Here's it, the little dot there is going to be sort of our comparison group here and looking at a risk score that was developed in, in Europeans and then applying that even to European Americans here to South Asians, to East Asians, and then to African ancestry groups here. And you can see that the ability of the risk score to predict outcomes declines and the variance increases. And I don't think you, we really should take this as a criticism of the field as much as a wake-up call that we need to be um, cognizant of where we're applying um, these risk scores. My last sort of caveat is this one. I'll bet half of us in the room, including myself, have written a sentence like this. Polygenic risk scores are of burgeoning interest to the clinical community. It ain't true, folks. <laughs> it may be true in some of our high-end institutions that we work in, um, but, but we need to be realistic and not overpromise about what's happening in, in sort of clinical care in, in middle America. I don't mean middle America as in the geography, by the way. And so what I've done is sort of gathered large health services publications that have queried um, healthcare systems. So each, each endpoint or each point here is not an individual, it's a healthcare system. And according to, and the, the references are down here, according to this publication, and this is on the high end, by the way, about 34% report regu regular use of risk score. Typically, this number is about 25 to 30 percent of healthcare systems use risk scores. When they looked at what the difference is among the healthcare systems, those that use risk scores prescribe more medicines. Okay, which is probably, if you think about it, it's more it's intuitively obvious. All right. Um, take note of this: using risk score. This is a different publication now. Uh, using risk scores, no evidence of harm. Well, that's a good thing but also no evidence of approved endpoints, all right? There is some evidence of improved risk factor control, probably because of the prescription of, of medicines that treat those risk factors. And then finally at the top, guess what the number one predictor of using a risk score in your healthcare system was? It's whether the physician had IT support. That was the predictor. So if those physicians or those healthcare systems that had good IT support for the physicians tended to use them, those that didn't, didn't. Um, and then when you interviewed the physicians, they tend to be good for you know, educating interns and conducting research. It comes back to your extremely valuable research tools. So finally, what do I think is their future? So first of all, how many of you have heard of hierarchical conditional categories? That's very interesting. I, I, I join you, by the way. Before this talk, I join you. I had never heard of them. But they are what determines CMS's payment um, per member per month to healthcare systems in an accountable care organization. They are driven by hierarchical conditional categories. All right? And how do you think they're calculated? Nope, you guessed it. They're, yeah, actuaries, but they're based on risk scores. They're based on risk scores. And then after the risk scores, uh, the, the, they calculate a, a risk-adjusted factor, and then that turns out into a payment. So they look at me. You know, I'm a, you know old, fat, white guy, which has hypertension, let's say. And then actuarially, they look, how much do they spend on old, fat, white guys who have hypertension the next year? Right? And then they, they provide those monies. So it's basically the risk for the individual, how much I'm going to spend on medicine in the next year. When I say medicine, it's health care. Okay? And, and this is, you guys probably don't know it, most of us have this calculated on us. All right? In fact, it's about 90% of people in 2018. 
have this thing calculated on it. And there are armies of people in, in the hallways or the basements usually of your, of your hospitals who are looking for inaccuracies and incomplete data in how we calculate this. Because if you can correct and make the data more complete and more accurate, the healthcare system gets more money. So, a couple of things about this HCC. First of all, it's based on multiple chronic conditions, and it's why I asked Adrian the question. It's ba in fact, it's based on about 9,000 conditions. And it's just, a, your, your, your risk score is just a sum of those 9,000 conditions. And so if we could figure out the genetic input of those 9,000 conditions, which I'm sure I've looked at them, I know we can, we could actually influence this process. The other is, it's interesting, there's disease interaction. They're not independent. For example, I just scanned maybe the first 1,000. The highest, the highest weight is given for diabetics with kidney disease. Those are expensive people, all right? And then the final point on this slide is it has to be in the medical record. If the information doesn't have an ICD-9 code, it doesn't get taken into account. Therefore, my sort of, and I am naive, by the way, my naive view of this is the challenge in genetic medicine is to figure out how to get genetic information, get it assigned ICD-9 codes, just like other conditions and risk factors, and how to get that information into the medical record. And it's not as naive as it sounds. So, so at, at the Genome Center in Baylor, Richard Gibbs and I are working together, in, in, again, in the cardiovascular space and developing basically a cardiovascular panel. Now, the monogenetic conditions are, are obvious, and then having a risk score, and then having a pharmacogenetic component to this. And this happens to be an example of, of a, um, a mock of a report. This individual in green, because it's green, has no clear monogenic conditions. This orange here is they have a high polygenic risk score, and the silver here is they actually um, have a, a moderate uh, mutation in terms of pharmacogenetics. So I think it's this kind of information that's easy for the physicians to read and also has something that can directly go into the, into the medical record and have an ICD-9 code assigned to it. And I think this kind of thing is really the future. So I'll, I'll stop there, but just summarize. Um, Mendelian and common disease gene discovery are supporting the foundations of, gen of polygenic risk scores. I think that's important to realize. Um, they're likely useful research tools, but I do think it's important we don't overpromise as we think about them um, in healthcare. Probably they're good tools also for clinical trials. Um, but then my last comment is that human genomics needs to engage in implementation science focused on real world healthcare settings. And I'll stop there and thank you very much. Super. Thank you, Eric. So thank some you. questions questions or comments for Eric. Eric. So thanks a lot. That was a great overview. I found I learned a number of things from it. And I'm gonna ask a question. I'm gonna ask you because you gave the introductory um, overview of this, but I welcome others around the table to answer this question. I'm going to, and I'm just trying to think about this practically, if we sort of think about the next 10 years. Right. And one of the things, of course, that will happen over the next 10 years will be a continued rapid accumulation of information about the biological significance of genomic variants. And then I was listening to your presentation, and you didn't go in deep into the statistics, and that's fine, but it's a black box of a lot of complicated stuff. And then, of course, even when you emerge with numbers, you then go into practice guidelines and the next set of things. And I'm just trying to imagine how this is all going to play out. And another, I mean, for, for example, are the kinds of calculations that are done to sort of to that black box set of statistics, are they amenable to um, uh, new data that could just, through a push of a button, recalculate it? Or is it the kind of thing that, as new knowledge is gained, new data comes in, you almost have to start over or have to really go back? And, I mean, I, I'm just trying to imagine a process by which we're going to constantly be in a position to refine anything that's been done at a statistical level, and are we building the, the framework for being able to do that in relatively real time? So I'll do good, good, good news, good news, bad news, and then someone else, please pick up. Um, I, the good news is, it was the purpose of the one slide. The black box is actually well-founded. 
and we can actually, in a transparent way, open it up and look at it. It just makes for a dry presentation at 9.30 in the morning. But it's, it's, there's good, solid science in that black box. It's not a, you know, a couple of chipmunks with a, with a calculator that are you know, making these scores. There's good foundation. I think the other good news in, in, is that I believe, based on everything I know, the scores are growable over time. So the genetic risk score for asthma today doesn't need to be the same as asthma in you know, five years from now because they're allowed to grow um, in, in a relatively straightforward way. I, I think the, the bad news, and it's not that bad, um, I believe as these risk scores get more complicated, we need to start to engage the FDA. My guess is they're going to want some sort of a device exemption about the calculation of these risk scores. To, you know, when we move away from just 10 loci that you sum up to much more sophisticated algorithms, my guess is we'll need to engage the FDA to have some sort of a exemption. They'll want to, they'll want some amount of oversight into this. But I still think that the um, it's not bad news. The, the, the big hurdle we need to get over is moving from more sophisticated health science centers into the, the health care at large in the community and engaging the payers. Make sure the payers are on board every step of the way. And, and this, this group and this, this research series, I think, has done an excellent job of continuously working to pull the payers in and continuously trying to engage the payers. Uh, so we have a lot of questions, and I would note we have a, a 20, or actually a 50-minute discussion session. So maybe, since we only have another minute or so, could we have comments directly on that point? All right, so Mark says he has one, Carlos says he has one, and Muin does. So we'll start with Mark, then Carlos, then Muin. Maybe I'll sit down if we just have a general discussion. <laughs> yeah, if you'd, if you'd like. That. Well, I think they're going to ask you questions. But okay, I'll start. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so th this was just a comment, on, on uh, and I think you're spot on. Um, I, given the FDA comment, though, I think it would be important to uh, make sure that we're not using the term black box indiscriminately, um, <laughs> because while you're correct that the um, – uh, genomic risk score could be, you know, conceivably have hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of individual genomic factors. The result will come out as a number that would right. then be um, incorporated with other factors that we can traditionally handle. And FDA, at least, in, is thinking about this from the perspective of could a physician uh, actually enter the numbers in and do the calculations and, and get an so, so that technically doesn't meet their criteria for, uh, for black box. Um, and I think it also, um, it, it's very clear that we can build systems by which, you know, if you have the information or don't have the information, uh, that you can proceed. So warfarindosing.org, for example, if you have all the clinical um, uh, information but don't have the genomic information, you can still use the dose calculator to give a, <coughs> uh, uh, a warfarin dose on the basis of, uh, of the clinical factors. So. I, would, I think you're right. I, I would envision that happening. I would envision it uh, being embedded in the electronic health record. And frankly, I think if the science is solid, um, the holy grail for, for third party payers, uh, for reasons that you um, indicated, is risk stratification because they recognize that the costs are driven by a small percentage. Right. I don't have a question, I have comments. Um, and so the. Um, I thought we were. I think we were in question three. So. Um, now we're taking an extra time on this uh, little internal discussion here. So, so the point is, is that um, th they have been looking for effective ways to be able to um, uh, assign disease management and other uh, interventions to those at the highest risk. So, right. if we have something that we can rely on, this will be valuable, and they will look look to uh, endorse it. And I, and I think it's relevant if you look at the Alzheimer's example, which was relatively simple, and simply presented. It is of note that. Uh, um, the high, those highest risk individuals were those that had a, a summation of genetic information. Great. So, um, so we did go a bit over. Um, Carlos, do you have a question or a comment? He's going to word a it a bit of both. Oh, okay. Actually, can you save the comment and just make the question? Just ask the question. Okay. My question <laughs> is, where is the delta? Okay, because I couldn't agree more with your point that it really comes down to where are the health savings to be demonstrated. And I think that there's no delta in the low risk group, right? Taking right. people off of statin and metformin doesn't 
save you a ton of money long term. Finding the people early for intervention does. In a genotype forward world, that makes a lot of sense, but we don't genotype forward. We genotype based on Sounds for like reading through the system. So where do you see the deployment of a polygenic test actually being deployed in the savings system today? Because it's not going to be in the Medicare system to, for diabetics with kidney. It's way too late at that point. Right. So I, again, I think it's going to be a threshold we're caught, we're, we will cross, and I'm confident we will cross it, that, um, that we're going to genotype much earlier in life in large healthcare systems, for example, Kaiser, several other around this table, that, that are willing to take that financial risk of the initial outlaying of money, and then because the data is that people stay within the system much longer, so it's, an, it's, it's a worthwhile investment, and then therefore, if indeed they can put people on therapies early, they improve healthcare quality, health, health, and save money in that order. So it's, my guess is it's going to be very large healthcare systems that will take that initial risk because people will stay in it. But even the uh, NHS doesn't do that yet. No. Nope. Thank you. Um, so Muin, a very quick, short quick question. question. Yes. Okay, polygenic versus monogenic. So one of the immediate, potential immediate applications of polygenic is to look at the, the end of the distributions, both very low and very high. So the case that Amit and the Broad Institute and others have been making is that, you know, you have polygenic cases that are one to five percent of the population at the same level as a monogenic risk. Is that a, in, in your view, a potential near-term application of the whole polygenic curve? Well, first, I don't spend a lot of time with polygenic versus monogenic because I think it's a continuum, number one. And I think number two, and in fact, Iftikhar is here, I think from the monogenic world, he and others have shown that if you change therapy based on genetic information, you can improve patient outcome. Because in the end of the day, if you're, if you're not changing therapy, who cares? And so basically, um, I, I think it doesn't matter. So I'm, I guess I'm agreeing or I'm answering yes to your question, whether it's a monogenic form or a polygenic form that pushes you out to the end of the tail. If we can show that it's actionable and it improves outcome, I think it'll, it'll have traction. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank so um, lots of things to discuss when we get to the discussion section. Uh, but next, um, we'll talk about risk prediction in non-European ancestry populations from uh, Fumi Olopade. <laughs> 